get people running. Good, good morning again to everyone. Um, thanks for making the time um, on this uh, Thursday uh, morning for you. It's a Thursday evening already here in Germany. Um, happy to see all of you. I, I think it's a strange time uh, for all of us, uh, not an easy time. Um, thankfully for you as a little update in Germany, we thankfully have um, managed quite well and it's looking like restaurants are going to open again uh, end of May. Um, just as a little side note, Bavaria has their priorities set up and beer gardens are the first things to open on May 15th. So they know <laughs> they have their priorities and so they do that. But um, we are not in Bavaria, we are also not making beer, we are only focusing on wine. And I wanted to give you a little bit of an impression because I think this is something that we can actually do quite well. And so I will give you a little bit of an impression about what it's like here at Robert Weil, first of all, because I think this is something um, that really stands out to us, that we are really a chateau and have our vineyards directly opposite. You see, it's a bright, wonderful day here in Germany. And people do the garden work in the evening. They enjoy the lovely weather. And you see directly in front of us our most prestigious vineyard site, the Kiefig Gräfenberg. And directly next to it, the Turmberg, which is also one of our chemicals. And we have a wonderful tasting room directly opposite to that, just to give you a little bit of an impression about what we're doing here. Now, getting back in, a little bit of that, and then I think we start with what we can do best, and I'll switch quickly my camera again, and I think it's really practical, I will share you the, the presentation with you, and um, give you a little bit of a rundown um, of Robert Weil, Quickly, if it lets me. So, I want the presentation. Just a second. Sorry, just a second, and then we can get things rolling. If you have any questions during the presentation, um, there is this little nice uh, possibility to uh, raise your hand, I think, then just quickly do it or write your question into the chat, and I, I will switch in. So, Weingut Robert Weil um, is located in Rheingau, as I told you, um, and we are about uh, 30 kilometers west of Frankfurt, about half an hour from Frankfurt Airport. So actually a very short ride. And what you can see here by while what our idea really is, um, is we want to combine tradition and modern times. So short um, thing on the here on the half an hour library. This is the 1893 Kietricher Auslese. Um, our estate is by Rango standards quite young. You see our founder directly next to this bottle. He's Dr. Robert Wein, and you can see as a winemaker, he's quite unusual because he's holding books instead of grapes or bottles. Um, he's only focusing, um, he was a professor for um, German at the University of Sorbonne in Paris. Um, definitely not a usual career for a winemaker or for a winery owner in the, in the Rheingau. Um, Due to the war between France and Germany, um, he was forced to leave uh, Paris and he came here because his brother was living here in our little village, Kietrich. And um, that's something that we, um, where we started. When you look on the Rheingau in general, we have 1,000 years of viticultural heritage. So 140 years is actually not so much. You can see the second generation on this 1893 wine, it's already declared as the Kaiser wine. Um, so the wine for the emperor, because um, even though we were quite young estate, um, we really soon got on the map um, with uh, our wines and were the official uh, supplier to the German court, uh, the Russian court, uh, the English court, and even the Austrian court bought this specific wine. So we had 
have a really long tradition to do so. Um, so on the barrel, you can see already the second generation, um, whose name was Wilhelm. And, to, and Wilhelm is getting older, as you can see on the right hand side, and he's again there with his son Robert, who's on the right on the top. And then Robert is also getting older, of course, and that's life. And you can see him in the bottom on the right uh, with his wife Carola. Today in charge, um, and you can see a certain um, theme here in the vial, um, is Wilhelm Weil. Uh, uh, the fourth generation, and you can see the name in the family always alternates uh, for the first son between Robert and Wilhelm. Um, what we're doing today is we're doing 100% racing. There's also something special about the Rheingau, and um, we will come back to that. The Rheingau has the highest um, percentage of racing grown all over the world. So racing is definitely king here in the Rheingau, and what we are focusing on is all the vineyards are located within two kilometers around the winery, a really focused and really strict quality origin. And this is what the estate looks today. I probably can give you a little bit of view of the estate house because this is on the other side. Um, you can see on the um, bottom, this is the room where I'm standing in. And then on top, this is the manor house. It's all um, directly next to each other. And on the right, I think this is what um, we stand most for. This is our um, world-renowned uh, Tiffany Blue label. Um, we live in up 30 years. Um, blue was actually the very first color used and label. So it's really, um, let's say, it's, on the one hand, it's quite traditional, but I think um, compared to other German labels, it's still quite easy to understand because it has a really clear structure. Um, definitely the Tiffany Blue, it stands out um, because I think we, when you see this, um, this uh, bottle shape together with a blue color, you immediately notice Robert Weil and it definitely stands out on a wine shelf or also, of course, uh, on a table in a restaurant. Um, so talking again, again about Ranga, I will show you later where I can um, I show, can show you later where this is exactly the Ranga is, as I said, about half an hour west. And the interesting thing about the Ranga is really it's only yeah, 3,100 hectares. So it's really small. This is one tenth of Champagne, if you put it into comparison. And uh, the interesting thing is the Rheingau is um, very diverse um, due to the fact that it was a coastal line. Furthermore, we are on the footsteps of the town hills, which are located in the north. And in the south, you have the Rhine River. And the Rhine River only um, comes from Switzerland. The spring is in Switzerland. And it goes all the way up north um, in Germany until it comes to those town hills. And these town hills are too strong. So it has to go for 30 kilometers around that around them and um, what is really specific about that is all the vineyards in the Rheingau are south and southwest facing. So we have on the one hand very diverse soil types from quartz over limestone to slate um, towards also different um, climate conditions. And this is also something where we can say today, we as Robert Weil, um, you can see the village Kietrich uh, in, on the map on the right. Um, Kietrich um, is a high, one of the highest elevated um, villages in the Rheingau with viticulture and um, our vineyards have profited tremendously by global warming um, simply because our wineries um, our vineyards are on top of the hill cool climate and our great-grandfathers and grandfathers they were struggling to achieve ripeness right today we do not have um, those issues anymore so we are only focusing as I said on vineyards that are located within two kilometers around the winery. And especially to mention are the two vineyards that I showed you in the very beginning, uh, the Turmberg, um, which means Tower Hill. You can see the tower on top of this vineyard, um, this big white thing, and the Grafenberg, um, which is the hill of the counts. So um, Grafenberg is the vineyard that you saw, saw directly opposite. Very steep vineyards. And all what all our vineyards have in common is that they all contain slate. Slate is really the major soil component for all of that and this is what really makes our vineyards um, stand out and here again you can you can see this is where we are right now this is uh, the winery and you can see the old manor house and then here on on, on the here on the right and um, this is a little bit an older picture when the addition of the cellar was not yet ready um, this is where we are right now and again you have um, the vineyards 
over here. And this is Grafenberg, this part of the slope. And then you have the Turmberg dark in next to next to it. You see this little tower. Once there was an entire castle on top of that, um, but today only the tower is left. The castle was abandoned actually in the 17th century. Um, because it's not in the market, I would just quickly go over Klosterberg. Klosterberg um, is back here. So this means Monastery Hill. Um, Klosterberg is a little bit higher elevated compared to the other vineyards, but it's um, less slate driven. It's not in your market. This is why I will not spend so much time on, on that. Um, the same is also true for Turmberg. Um, Turmberg, again, Tower Hill. It's our monopole vineyard. It's not in your market, um, just as a difference towards uh, Klosterberg. It is much more slate driven, much more distinctive. Um, very sharp, very. And, and most of the market, um, let's say seven, has been kind of um, intense on that uh, in BC. And I think Brendan and Carrie, you uh, you know these wines quite well. This is the Grafenberg. Grafenberg is one of the oldest vineyards actually in Rheingau. Um, it was first mentioned in 1258 as Monstring in Latin, uh, which means the hill of the Rhine counts. Um, as you can see, in this picture was taken uh, during the sunset. It's southwest facing, gets the um, soft night, uh, soft light uh, during the sunset, and for us has ideal conditions. What makes the wines here really special is that um, in Grafenberg we have been able in the last 31 vintages to produce at least five different ranges um, of Riesling, starting with the dry uh, Riesling, going to Spätlese, late harvest, going to Spätlese, um, and then to Beeren Aussies and Trockenbeeren Aussies. These are really specific wines, um, noble sweet wines, harvested from shrumbled berries. So very intense and uh, very amazing wines, to put it that way. Um, what we also do is we have auction wines uh, as well. So we do noble sweet wines that are only sold at the auction. And this uh, one wine from Grafenberg, the 2003 Trockenbeeren aus the Gold Capsule, one bottle was sold for 5,100 euros. Um, but then on top of that is the VAT 19%. So a really good price for that. Um, but I think um, more interesting are definitely the, um, is the GG, for example, um, which is quite which is available in your market. Uh, and, and I think... A wonderful wine which we always get also great uh, results for 95 96 points robert parker and james suckling are usually a given same for wine spectator um we are working we are not certified organic um but we are working any vineyards organic um especially in our top vineyard sites in the grafenberg turmberg and, Klo and klosterberg we are planning to extending that but we are not certified by for us quality really originates in the vineyards because you can never produce a wine that tastes better than the grape it was produced from. And um, again, when you look here on the, on the right, um, you can see there are already some uh, noble rotten berries. What we are doing is we are spending enormous efforts um, in the vineyards. So what we are going to do is we will do up to 17 passes during the harvest time. So we will not what you see here on the vines, we will not harvest them all at at, um, at all uh, at one time. So this picture was already taken when this vine was visited at least ten times in Grafenberg. So, and then we would come again and only pick um, the, some of these berries for Auslese. Auslese usually will be one hundred percent healthy fruit. Um, here, for example, this would be this um, cluster would be quite ideal. The one on the right. Um, in the center. This would be quite ideal, for example, for um, Auslese, um, while, for example, for this one, for those here on top, we will let them hang even longer to only have really shrambled berries and to produce the luscious sweet wines, the Bären Auslese and Trockenbären Auslese. So this is really for us, it's an enormous key. And as you can see, the vineyards are quite steep. And here again, this picture was taken in Grafenberg. And here, back here, this is where I'm standing right now. And this is where I um, took the picture early on uh, when we started the meeting. So we, have, uh, we are extremely close to all our vineyards. Uh, work in the cellar for us is, of course, it's a, 
I mean, we always talk a lot about the vineyards. We always talk about how close we are and that we have a fantastic um, uh, place for racing because our soil types, our vineyards are designed for racing with their cool climate and with the uh, slate soils. But it's very, let's say, also the seller is important. And we have the big advantage that our part where we are receiving the grapes is 100% working with gravity. Today, um, most of the wines are pressed full cl cluster, um, but we also do maceration for dry wines, like for the Grettenberg Großes Gewächs. And we are also, even some small parts for that wine, for example, are even completely fermented on the skins. So we are spending also quite a, quite a lot of effort um, to produce, make sure that the quality that we get from these 17 passes also um, helps us to get um, really into um, into the cellar. And furthermore, um, we are also using, next to the stainless steel, um, we are also using these big oak barrels that you can see here. These are quite large ones. Um, these are 2,400 liters. And you see this very big one here, that's actually 4,000. And they are quite neutral, so they are not toasted, unlike barrel barrels. Um, and we are only using them for the dry wine. But for us, um, the question of quality, it's not so much a question of quality. If you use stainless steel or oak, it's much more um, about um, the style. For dry style wines from the Premier Cru and Grand Cru, we always take the oak barrels, but for for these here because there we have the chance to produce more elegant and light. And make wines a little bit more elegant. And um, I would like to start with that because classification, especially when it comes to German wines, I think is quite complicated because it is a very unique system. And what you see in front of you is the oldest brilliant classification map that you um, that exists. Um, this was made in 1867 and it's classifying the entire Rheingau. And here you see again what, what I mentioned earlier, that you have the strip of the Rhine. Here you have the city of Mainz, a little bit smaller in those days than it is today. Um, and it goes, it comes from the south and then it turns um, from east to west at the city of Wiesbaden and Mainz. And then it turns around. And our winery, for example, is up here. You see here again, if you look close in the center, you see Kietrich and our vineyards in those days were already classified in dark red and, uh, and red. So this is something that we are doing as well. Um, we have still this old classification map. This map actually is the base for our classification like we have it today. But what makes um, our wines, or what makes Riesling quite unique is the fact that you have different styles of freezing. And this is um, what we have done here again. You see here on top, um, we are a member of the VDP. Um, the VDP is the elite association of German wine growers. Um, there are only 200 members uh, in the VDP. Um, you only get in there with an um, invitation. And every time you see this eagle with a grape on top of the bottle, uh, this means the producer is a member of the VDP and it therefore belongs to one of the top producers. And the VDP has come back to this traditional classification like we know it from the old days. And we have four different tiers, which is similar to Burgundy, you have the Gutswein. Um, Gutswein is similar to Domaine, which you see here. And it's really, it's the beginning of a high, um, it's the beginning of our uh, estate. And here again, you can see you have the Riesing, uh, Riesing Token, for example, a dry star Riesing. And then on the, on the right, for example, you would have the Riesing Tradition, which is also available um, in your market. And then next in line comes the Kietricher. Kietricher is the village level, so it's uh, similar to Village. And uh, the Village level um, really is uh, a blending of the two Premier Crus and Grand Cru at Robert Weiss. So, also a little bit a step up in quality, which is also available. The Premier Cru's are not available uh, in Canada. Maybe this will uh, change in the future. But in fact, um, this, this is, let's say, medium level single vineyards. And then on top of everything is the Große Lage. And Große Lage is uh, corresponding to Grand Cru. 
And again, the big difference with Riesling is if you go, for example, if you go to Burgundy, if you have a chef or Chambertin, you know exactly what you're going to get. You're going to get Pinot Noir. If you go to Montfrachet, you know that um, um, it's going to be Chardonnay. So it's really clear when you're in Burgundy, there's only grown grape variety in, in one vineyard. It's a very strict system. While you have in um, with Riesling, you can make all these different kinds. With here with the Token, um, and then you can make Spätlese, you can make Auslese and Bären Auslese. And I would say we're in a really lucky situation because even in Germany, even though Germany is very famous for all those wines, there are only some places where you can actually grow dry Riesling as well as off dry Riesling and Nova Sweet Riesling at the same time. So this is really also for people asking why we embrace um, that characteristic so much and are spending so much effort on it. Um, last but not least, I already mentioned it and I always uh, like to point out, um, especially also for the um, vintage 2018, um, we are waiting right now, of course, for the first release of 2019 reviews. Um, the, for the 2018, for example, we got uh, from, we got uh, a James Suckling uh, 100 points for our TBA. Um, and we, at, uh, as I said, also at Robert Parker, for example, you get 96 points for uh, dry racing from our Grand Cru. So there is enormous potential um, that we have here. And that's it about Robert Weil, what we are doing here in the Rheingau. And as I said, we're only doing Rheingau here in the Riesling, um, only Riesling here in the Rheingau. But um, you already, what I told you also, um, Riesling and Rheingau is, is a match. It belongs together simply because um, there is no other area in the world where you grow more Riesling than here um, in the Rheingau, definitely. Any questions so far about the Rieslings before we go over to the other side of the river? How nope. do you uh, measure the yields from your vineyards? And if you have um, 17 passes, how do you monitor that? It really depends. Let's say the yields are quite, let's say when you, when you were having um, Nova Sweet wines like TBA, like BA, for example, for, for a TBA in a good year, we make about 600 full bottles of it, 750s. Um, and then, for example, for the, for the Bären Aussies, we make around 1,000 bottles. And then for the Aussies, we make uh, 2,000 um, 2,000 bottles and this is really, let's say, this is for the Nova Streets, you have a really super small portion. Um, for the dry wine, for the Rosses Quebecs, because there you only use healthy grapes, there of course you have much, let's say, greater yields, but we go down to 40 hectoliters per hectare usually for that. So this is, uh, this is really a big difference um, that we do. But it's a good question because when I tell you, hey, we're making five wines from one vineyard, you ask, okay, how much how much grapes do these guys have there? Um, and it's a really good question, uh, but it's really that way that for the Nova Street wines, you have such a reduced yield. And we also always, tr um, gam we like gambling a little bit. Um, we, make, I we try to make ice wine, um, but ice wine with global warming, global warming for us has really the negative aspect that ice wine is becoming more and more impossible for us. The last ice wine that we made was actually vintage 2016. Um, and um, that was actually harvested in the first week of 2017. So the gap becomes longer and longer and it's really complicated because simply like in many other places in the world, you have to harvest it frozen on the vine and that's uh, becoming more and more a challenge. But again, in general, I would say we have profited tremendously um, uh, for, uh, for, um, for global warming. That's something going on in the chat. So that. Great, thank you very much. That does answer my question. No, no perfect, thanks. Um, uh, what do you mean is it's all the same for Germany, Carrie? The ice wine production, is everyone having yeah, the same? That, yeah, that's always the same. It's, um, it's very strictly regulated. Um, you have, uh, for example, if you want to make ice wine, um, we have to um, apply, not apply, but we have to register um, the vineyard uh, by beginning of the harvest where, where we plan to make ice wine. And then as soon as we have harvested the ice wine, we have to uh, inform the, um, the authorities in Germany within 48 hours. And they will check 
if it was cool enough in that night, in theory, to produce ice wine. And this is, for example, some people have sometimes claimed to me that they produced ice wine and the, the authorities say, no, it was technically impossible that it's ice wine. And so they um, have to rate it down to another sweet wine level. And that makes, of course, a big difference for them. Um, but that's really something that we do. Uh, one thing that I have, is, is the clear carry or? Um, one thing that I haven't really touched so far is um, are the brutes. I think um, the the, sec the sparkling wine uh, for BC. Um, we are making sparkling wine for quite a long time. Um, German, we in Germany, we are quite uh, keen on that production, and I think it's definitely something to watch in general because we have more and more people g engaging much more in sparkling wine. Um, we're doing brut and extra brut there right now. It's all racing, of course, um, but I think it's a really uh, interesting style that we make, definitely. So before we go into the Robert White Junior wines, I would just like to show you some something that I uh, created earlier, because I think that's uh, also really important. Um, I wanted to show you where we are exactly. Just a second. So, okay. Let me do it differently here. So, okay. show you two pictures. So you have Germany here, and the, where you see the blue spot, that's where we are right now. Or oh, that's where I am right now. And furthermore, if you, and this is really how close we are. But again, here you have um, Frankfurt very close by. Uh, all the yellow stuff is our streets, of course. So you can also see that we, uh, because we are so close to Frankfurt, we actually have a very great infrastructure close by. So it's really not a problem to go from uh, fr Frankfurt airport uh, to the winery within half an hour. So it's very, very convenient if you can travel, let's say. And, oh, sorry, and then we just, because the interesting thing is really when you when you look on on our estate on um, on vineyards on this side of the river on the northern side of the river, but on the other side uh, of the river you have in this area here you have the biggest wine production area in Germany, which is called Rheinhessen, and Rheinhessen is a very different um, kind uh, of styles that um, that they make um, and Rheinhessen for us with different aspects because they have also more limestone etc um, it was for us very tempting to do something and this is why we decided that we cross the river that we go over and that we start uh, Robert Weil Junior and Robert Weil Junior is only focusing on the Pinot varieties and um, for us Robert Weil Junior is um, definitely also important because it gives us a complete new opportunity. Um, Robert Weil uh, definitely is a complete um, Robert Weil Junior, I'll show you here. Um, Robert Weil Junior was, uh, was an idea that Wilhelm, my boss, had in mind for the last 10 years. So his idea was really, he wanted to create wines um, that were on a that we're not Riesling because in the end we are really known as a Riesling Chateau. We are 100% Riesling. We are two kilometers within two kilometers around winery. And we used to produce even a little bit of Pinot Noir until 2012 in the Rheingau, but we decided to stop that because we simply saw that it does not pay off for us as well as the Riesling. And why should you make um, Pinot in a place where it's perfect for Riesling. But in Rheinhessen we see it exactly the opposite way, um, even though there are great Rieslings there. But we said, okay, we want to do something completely new. Um, and this is how Robert Weil Junior was designed. And we said, of course, we also want to have a complete different approach here. And so this is why you have here the Robert Weil Junior wines in a black label, but again with our blue aspect here, they come for a complete different price. When you compare, for example, the estate level trocken at Robert Weil and the estate level tradition, the Rieslings, um, they, uh, 
they are roughly double the price Exceller compared to what you have in the uh, Robert Wright Jr. range. And we decided to make a uh, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Gris, uh, Chardonnay, Rosé and Pinot Noir. Um, so far you have available the Weissburgunder, the Pinot Blanc and the Spätburgunder. And even though it sounds a little bit odd, it's just like these Pinot varieties next to the Riesling are the second big thing here in, in Germany when it comes to viticulture. It's either Riesling or the Pinot varietal. And for us, it was sort of a step because let's say it's a little bit like everywhere in the world. Um, you make always funny jokes about your neighbors. And in the Rheingau, we make uh, bad jokes about Rheinhessen. And if you're in Rheinhessen, you make bad jokes about the Rheingau. So it's a little bit that way it always goes back and forth. And I think the Pinot, the Pinot Blanc, the Weißburgunder, here you have it. We decided um, together with Christopher and uh, Selvin that we are going to stick with the uh, German label, with the Weißburgunder for the front. Um, here in the English presentation, you have the uh, Pinot Blanc label, you have the international description. But the idea was really that say that we wanted to make wines that are drinky, that have a certain approach. And it's not just that we buy wine there, we have contracted partners that are doing everything like we want them to do. And um, the wines should be a little bit more drinky and a little bit more elegant. Um, right now there's a little, you're getting 2018 um, because 2019 was not yet bottled when, uh, when you ordered. And for the Pinot Noir, it's also um, 2017 because we have not bottled the new vintage yet, especially for the Pinot Noir, our experience after the first two vintages, the first vintage was 2016, Second win um, and second vintage 2017. Obviously, we have made the um, experience really that if the wines have a little bit more time uh, on the bottle, the Pinot, the Pinot Noir, then they offer much, much more. And for us, let's say it was uh, an absolute must, uh, yeah, a given that we said, okay, we want to have. Why is it not loading? Um, <laughs> that we that we go into um, Pinot Noir as well, but also for Rosé and Chardonnay, because simply for us, the, the Pinots are a family, a family of grapes, and that it was quite important to us that we show the entire family. Um, there will not be a Riesling available uh, from Robert Weil uh, in, in the foreseeable future uh, from Robert Weil Jr., because simply it makes no sense to us to, make, to do that, because um, we are really seeing it more similar to Bordeaux that we have right bank and left bank. Um, right bank is reserved for Riesling, right bank of the Rhine River is Rheingau, and the left bank is the, are the Pinot varietals. And that's something that's, that really matters to us. What you can also see, and I can send um, this, present, um, this flyer to you again, um, we are in the very lucky or very fortunate situation that uh, our MW um, from Germany, one of our MWs, Caro Maurer, um, she has, um, and given all the Robert Weil Junior wines ratings and all the wines so far have succeeded quite well um, with the highest rating that she's given them. For us, um, these wines um, I think are quite ideal for Monopoly because uh, Monopoly markets like in Quebec, also in um, Ontario, but also of course in BC if we have the chance to go there. Um, but on the other hand, I think also the Pinot Blanc um, is very drinky. It's 100% um, stainless steel um, and it's really crisp. It's extremely fresh. Um, it's definitely for us a bridge um, towards the Riesling world because it has more this crispy and fresh characteristic compared to the other Pinot varietals. And I think that's, um, that's really interesting. Um, we, we have a little bit of Saint Laurent in, in the rosé, actually, yes. Um, but you, let's say the major blend um, or the major grape variety is always Pinot Noir. Um, but we also, let's say, in the 2017 vintage, uh, 2018 vintage, sorry, we even had a little bit of Merlot in it because we got a contracted partner who had an amazing plot of Pinot, Pinot Blanc. And he said, you only get the Pinot Blanc uh, if you take the Merlot. And we, then we said, okay, what are we going to do? And then we said, okay, then we just <laughs> added into the rosé and it actually gave it a little bit, uh, really some nice structure. And the wines are really completely new. Um, 
uh, for us still, and we are slowly expanding it. Um, we were actually quite surprised. We started with Vintage 2016 in Germany, and uh, we started with 100,000 bottles uh, per grape variety on the 1st of March. And we had one exclusive partner, the biggest retailer in Germany, and uh, we were sold out by October. Um, so we didn't have one single bottle left. So it was quite an impressive result. In the meantime, we, because the project was that successful, we were able to um, add some more contracted partners. And that's really important. Um, again, Pinot Noir, what is always funny is I think um, maybe Francois can tell you a little bit more about that later, but I think it's really amazing um, because many people still a little bit similar like sparkling wine they do not think of Germany as a red wine producing country. And actually Germany is the third largest producer um, of Pinot, Pinot Noir in the world. Um, number one is France, obviously. Number two is the, are the United States. And number three is actually Germany. So Germany has a wide range, a long, long term, long tradition of producing Pinot Noir. Um, our idea is really, we want to make a cool climate Pinot here. So we want to make a really elegant, really light Pinot. I think uh, for the price, what I, what's my experience, not only in Germany, but also in the markets that have it, um, like also Japan and uh, also Korea, I've seen tremendous success with this wine because actually the price quality ratio is quite great. And I remember I was showing this wine uh, together with Francois to some customers and um, they were quite, I think, surprised a little bit about the quality and also they were uh, they thought that um, the the quality for the price is really great, and I think we had some good success with that as well. Um, but maybe Francois can tell you a little bit more about that. All right, any questions on the Pinots or any th questions in general? Do you see a limit on the uh, uh, volume you can produce with the the junior wines, or is there? Sky's the limit, uh, depending on the as long as you can get the quality. Uh, let's let's say there is there is a limit, definitely. Um, thankfully, so far we have not reached that uh, limit. We can we have a, we have a good supply, so you can go out and sell. Um, it's really that way. That as I said, we are not just buying wine because we really take this project as serious as our racing. It was as I said, it's a project that was in our minds or in the mind of Wilhelm for for ten years already. And in the very beginning, we even thought that we would bring all the grapes to the Rheingau. But that's technically impossible because it would uh, take you an hour at least, if you're lucky, um, to go from Rheinhessen with a tractor to come to the Rheingau. And that one hour would mean that you have one hour of transport with maybe warm conditions where you would need dry ice and all this stuff. And we said this is a too big of a compromise. And this is where almost the entire idea of Robert Wild Jr. died. And then we thankfully found a partner with a very good seller who said, okay, um, I can do that for you. And then we said, okay, but then we have to have the control. So, and because the Pinots ripen earlier, what we are doing is um, before we start harvesting here in the Rheingau with the Rieslings, we will go over to Rheinhessen and watch over the production um, in Rheinhessen and then come over uh, and do the reasons here, but it's all with contracted partners But even within the year um, we are checking the vineyard. So we are quite strict with that. So let's say right now. There's not a limit I would say right now we we have a proper supply um, But of course you will soon sooner or later you have to find people that Understand what our goal is because we don't want to have any fruit. We want to have fruit that is also matching our idea that we have with the wine, that we want to have really drinky wines and not wines that are too high in alcohol. Um, and this is something that we actually really want to achieve because also the Pinot Blanc um, should not be higher than 12.5%. 12, uh, 12 uh, and also the Pinot Noir should not be higher than 13%. So we have certain ideas. We don't want to extract too much. We want to make the wines really drinky and elegant. So this is why for us it was really important or is important still um, that we find the right partners. If we find more partners that can work like we want, like we want it, then the sky is the limit. But uh, I think that will be the biggest struggle uh, in the future to find those people. Thank you very much. You're welcome. 
Nicholas, when it comes to uh, the four tiers on the pyramid from Gutswein all the way up to Großlag, does German wine law permit um, all levels of sweetness uh, within those four tiers? And then also, is, does it apply to all regions within Germany? Um, uh, first of all, it's not wine law. So it's uh, the classification of the VDP. Um, so it's a private um, classification, first of all. Um, but Germany is due to make a new wine law within the next five years, thanks to the European Union. And we will definitely see this um, classification being sort of implemented to all over Germany. For all VDP members, and what you also see is many, um, for all VDP members in Germany, this is the official classification. And in I mean, you could make an estate level Auslese, but it simply makes no sense because then you make an entry level Auslese or Bären Auslese or Token Bären Auslese. In theory, you can make that, um, but usually it makes no sense because when you spend so much effort on a TBA or BA or Auslese, um, you can simply um, make it as a, as a single vineyard. It does, make, it does not make sense to, to mix it together. But for example, what you see, um, what you have in BC available is the cabinet and the Spätlese. And there, for example, you're on the estate level and you can go up to Spätlese, uh, Spätlese level, for example. So that's, that's a given. You can, in theory, in all levels, in all four levels, in all four tiers, um, you, you can produce uh, all different kinds of sweetness. There is no regulation. There are even some producers in the Mosel that do not make dry style releasing. So you have, um, in theory, you do, you're not even obliged to make a Großes Gewex. You don't have to make it. If you don't want to, if it's not suiting your style, then forget it, you're not forced to do it. Um, but you, in theory, you can, you can make all the different sweetness levels in all tiers, yes. And it's all the same in Germany, but it's not wine law technically. But as I said, I, I think we are on a, on a good way that uh, we actually can, uh, can have this uh, in the future for everyone and you also see many people outside the VDP they are adapting um, that system actually so many young winemakers they they would do exactly the same classification they will even use the same wording because the VDP also has said the classification is open for everyone who applies to our rules so this is something that has worked out quite well and and how important is the VDP in Germany um, the VDP, is, it's really an important um, association, even though it's only 200 members. Um, if you look on Germany, we have around 8,000 uh, wine growers all over Germany, so we have uh, quite a lot. But in fact, the VDP is really the most renowned and a really important one. It has a lot of influence because simply um, the best vineyards in Germany are usually owned by VDP members because these are let's say these are producers that have been around for 200, 300 years and they have produced great wines ever since. And so this is why they have usually the best vineyards really. And um, this is why, even though it's a small uh, association, it has great influence in many ways. If you go, for example, to Provine, um, it is one of the busiest booths in Provine, for example, in Germany. And um, definitely has a, has a great influence, that's for sure.